Welcome to Doc Talk Live. Uh, I'm with Dr. Chad Stevens in Texas. Um, Dr. Stevens is a pain and sports uh, doctor who uh, I tried to do a show with uh, this weekend, and we just couldn't get the uh, the internet to work. So we're both sitting in our respective offices. And uh, thank you for doing this again, Chad. I appreciate you coming on. No, of course. Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry about Saturday, but I guess uh, between the lake and your house, we just had no connection or something. Yeah, it was it was it was frustrating to say the least. But I, you know, I I'm just going to start over with you, Chad. I, I the, the the funny story is is that Christy, who helps me um, with Doc Talk Live and and helps me uh, arrange things with guests and and tries to get the the information out there she says i want you to meet chad stevens uh he's really cutting edge and he does a lot of cool things and and she says i think you'll really like him i'm like sure let's set it up so we set it up and then the next day um one of my representatives who i work with um comes to me and says you know there's this guy in texas chad stevens uh who's doing such and such you know you really ought to look at this particular procedure and i'm like Wow. Somebody's telling me to talk to Chad Stevens. So it's, uh, you know, in, in different sort of spheres of of my of my world. So welcome. Thank you for coming on, Chad. Oh, you're welcome. And five minutes ago, I was talking to a rep that we know in common, Neil Doherty. And he, he said to tell you hello during our time. He was like, how did your had your conversation with Brad? Do? I'm like, well, you know, we're going to do it again today. And he's like, well, Brad's awesome. So hello from Neil. Uh, maybe he'll tune in. Um, Chad, tell me a little bit about your background, really more for our listeners than anything else. How did you get from 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 college to med school to to residency to what you do? So I, I'm kind of an odd you know, guy. I, I wasn't the son of a doctor or a, a long line of doctors. And so when I went through college, I, I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field, but I looked at different options such as um, physical therapy. I looked at other ways I could be in the medical field and really found out that what I wanted to do was be in a field where I could make uh, the most difference for my patients, where I would be not just following a series of orders or protocols the doctor wanted, but doing something myself. So during college, I worked as a physical therapy aide all the way through school, which was great. But then when I graduated, I decided to go to graduate school. And so I did that in San Antonio and did a, gra a graduate degree in uh, master's in physiology. And while I was doing that, I worked on the organ transplant team and on their vascular team um, assisting in surgery. So I got a lot of good experience operating with some of the best, you know, uh, cardiothoracic guys and vascular surgeons of the world, really. And, you know, so I got a lot of good surgery experience there. But I realized when I was in graduate school that I really didn't want to be stuck in a lab. So that's when I applied to school and got accepted in Des Moines. So I went to Des Moines for uh, my medical degree. I had a great time there, got involved in the uh, – both, you know, the different clubs involved. I was class president for four years, got to get really close to the administration and kind of learn how things click in a university setting. And then uh, when I graduated, I was trying to decide on the specialty I wanted to pursue. And I thought I wanted to be either orthopedic surgeon or ear, nose and throat. So I did my interviews in both of those things and realized that something very important about myself, and that is that I don't like bad outcomes. I want to help people I don't want to be stuck in a room for two, three hours because I don't have the attention span. Like I assume you don't either, Brad, but we're, we're kind of ADHD in our own way that we want to do things that give people a good result by doing things quick. And that's when I kind of fell into pain management. And so I initially started a sports medicine fellowship in Fort Worth and got to be the inaugural member and pick my partner who is still in practice in Fort Worth. And then uh, we did some mild interventional procedures, mainly in the lumbar region. I went to Indiana and joined a big orthopedic group and did a little bit of everything there. And they told me, hey, you know, you're, you're so qualified to do bigger procedures. Why are you not doing them? And I started asking myself the same question. What I ultimately decided to do was go back and do a pain fellowship. And, and then I ultimately taught in the pain fellowship after that in Fort Worth also. So um, really unique training from primary care sports medicine to pain. And I believe that makes my practice um, one very much based on functionality and not just on vascores. And so I really hear me talk about that a lot. 
so back and forth, you went Texas and Des Moines and then back to Texas and then yeah. back to Indianapolis and now back to Texas. So you go south to north, south, north. One thing that you hit on, which I think I'd like to spend a little bit of time on is I agree with you. Um, I also like to see um, immediate, I, I like immediate gratification. Right. So I like to see my patients um, if they have some sort of intervention, have fairly immediate results. Absolutely. I, I don't like this waiting for six weeks or three months or whatever it is. I like to see a difference right away, which, which I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the right way at all. I'm just saying that you sort of recognize your personality and what, right. what draws you to, various aspects of pain medicine. You said this weekend that you like to do the procedures that nobody else does. And, and I thought that was kind of interesting. And so tell our listeners about some of the procedures that you like to do. Well, when I, when I say that, um, I don't mean that to be condescending or rude or anything. What I'm really trying to say is my practice is based on not trying to go out and solicit lumbar epidurals and SI joint injections and things that all the pain doctors do, but rather the things that, that are a little bit more um, skill involved, maybe a less amount of doctors do them. And I see really good results such as SI joint fusions instead of just injections or radio frequency ablation of the knee, hip and shoulder instead of just doing the axial skeletal. Or, you know, we did the, we both did a, we had four vertiflex cases this morning. That's been one of those additions to the practice, which has been phenomenal. And you, you know, there's a bunch of things like that. Do you have any models with you or anything like that? Um, I have a model. I'll, I do. Um, let's see. Let's get our models out. Um, yeah. You want to get my vertiflex picture or what model do you no, want? Well, I think we'll go to the SI. I mean, you okay. mentioned the SI. Yep. Uh, so uh, I'm sort of backwards, but there's an SI joint. That's right. Um, and as a sports guy, you must have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of thought about SI joint pain. So maybe, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time on this show talking about the SI joint. Okay. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that for our, for our viewers. Yeah. So for, for many years, I've gone to radio frequency ablation of the SI joint after a couple of shots and, and the patients have been very satisfied and done well for a year or two years. And we use a, a model that's, that's called Coolief, which is a, a larger lesion, which seems to work really well for those patients. But now that there are new things on the horizon, I bring those up to patients. I say, well, we can do what we've done in the past, or we could fuse this joint with a corner lock fusion. Or if you're interested, what we could do is we could put a little stem wave lead right along the middle clunial nerve and you can stimulate your nerve. So we have three options to treat the same thing instead of just, you know, just the steroid shots are temporary. And so um, if you look for SI joint disease, and you know this, Brad, then, you, then you'll see it almost in every room. If you, if you touch the, I'm going to say posterior superior iliac spine, because at my house, when you say PSIS, you get a bunch of giggles, but that's because I have young kids, right? When you touch the PSIS, on a lot of our patients, they're going to have pain. And the reason they have pain is because that comes down and goes into the SI joint and they can radiate into their groin, into their tailbone, even down the thigh or the leg. And so I believe it's a joint that kind of gets forgotten. And the reason I think that is because when I do blocks on them, they get temporary relief. And then when we do a fusion or an SI ablation or a stem wave, then we're finding, you know, long-term relief for them. And, and even a funny story a spine surgeon called me out at a, at a dinner I was doing where I, I call them the do what I do dinners and all these spine surgeons come and one of them stood up. He's a very funny guy. And he, he stood up, he goes, I'm mad at you, Chad. I'm like, Oh, this is the wrong time to say this. Right. And he goes, I had a patient I was going to do a lumbar fusion on and you did an SI fusion. You fixed them. And I didn't do my lumbar fusion. <laughs> and we, we both had a good laugh. And he said, no, seriously, man, I'm going to be sending these cases to you because it only makes sense that, if you just do a steroid shot, you're going to get a flash of, of improvement for a short term. But if you come and actually fuse that joint or denervate that joint, then they're going to get a lot longer relief and a lot more satisfaction. So, so Chad, I'll tell you, I have not gravitated to either of those procedures. Okay. Um, and my, my, and, and I'm bringing this up because, you know, I, I want our listeners to see how doctors learn. Right. And how doctors, um, you know, have to sort of consider things. And my issue with the SI joint what has always been 
I have a hard time in terms of thinking of this joint as so lax that it needs to be stabilized so strongly. Okay. So that makes it challenging for me intellectually okay. to gravitate toward that particular procedure. Okay. Um, so that would be my issue with, with fusion. I want you to talk a little bit about, because you're coming at this differently. Right. You see this as a bi biomechanically unstable joint right. that needs to be solidified. Right. So talk to us a little bit about that and where where my thinking is off. Well, I would say solidified or denervated, right? Because either way, we, we know that the pain is, is coming from that joint because we've proven it through a series of injections, either with or without steroid. We can debate what you do there. But some kind of diagnostic blocks, either in the joint or branch blocks, lateral branch blocks, that show that your, your joint is a large part of your problem. So if you just look at your little model there, Brad, and you push up on the ischial tuberosity, when people sit down, they're pushing up on that and it's making that joint move up and down, right? Sure. So a lot of people that come in- Perhaps. Because, Perhaps it's making the joint move up and down. Perhaps you're just pushing the whole body up. I think I think from, from a anecdotal standpoint anyway, I'm not going to quote a lot of stu studies on this, but- what I've heard, you know, I've been practiced maybe longer than you, but since 2004, I've been practicing. And people that have SI joint pain hurt when they lie on that side. Sometimes they even hurt when they lie on the contralateral side, but they always hurt when they sit. And they always kind of find themselves listing from one side to the other. And I believe that's the movement that's brought about by compression of the ischial tuberosity. So I work at the joint as if it's, and, and you know, people will oftentimes read an image and say, there's um, irregularity of the joint, or but you can't tell if an SI joint is the source of complaint or concern until you actually inject it and confirm it. But the patients that have that happen and they get a great response to an ablation, let's say, they will find when they do the fusion on just one of the SI joints that they will no longer have pain on the other side. Just getting one side fused seems to be enough to stabilize the pelvis enough to decrease their pain from sitting and activities. And it's, it's a pretty phenomenal um, thing I'm seeing over and over. And you might want to consider that for your patients. So a friend of mine, um, actually the same person who, who mentioned you, he, he, Rich, he said, he said, think about a woman who has a baby. You know, we secrete, they secrete a hormone called relaxin, relaxin. which relaxes mm -hmm. the SI joint. Right. And he said, says it's kind of like a balloon. When you blow a balloon up for the first time, it's kind of hard to blow it up. Right. And then you let the air out, you blow it up again, yep. and it gets a little bit laxer. Yeah. True. And the walls get a little bit looser. He says you blow that up multiple times. Right. In those patients, you're more likely to have, let's say, a, 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 a less um, mechanically sound joint. So True. I don't know if you treat a lot of uh, women that have had multiple childbirths, but that may be a a a uh, a patient population that would have more SI pain. No, that's a great point. I mean, just think about how many fusions do you see a day, right? People that have had fusions, we know if they have an L5S1 fusion, there everybody agrees. Nobody's going to dis uh, dispute the fact that the disc above the fusion is going to get more trauma and eventually degenerate and cause, you know, herniation and, and be, ex and have the fusion extended, right? Absolutely. The, the joint distal to the fusion is the SI joint. So the same concept is true. People that are rock solid at one level are going to have more movement at, at the other level and they're going to have more pain. Let's see. There might be some questions here. Um, uh, Chad, talk a little louder or closer to the mic. <laughs> Maybe talk louder, Chad. I'm talking so loud you can't believe it. My whole office can hear me. Can, can you not hear me very well? That's better. Yeah, that's better. Okay, and sorry. Jerome says, could the pain associated with sitting uh, come from the lower disc? Yes. And, 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 yeah, and I agree with Jerome because, because um, yeah, I mean, you were also describing somebody who I would consider had discogenic pain or vertebrogenic pain. Right where they sit down, how could you di differentiate from SI pain clinically? So that means you can't use your needle, I believe. 
Well, you can, you can, I mean, people that have degenerative disc disease or vertebrogenic pain are not going to have a positive Faber's test or SI compression test or pain Patrick's finger sign test. I mean, SI joint can be kind of an imitator of other things, but I would say the more, the more than just degenerative disc disease, it will sometimes imitate like a, a, like a lumbar disc that is causing a significant radiculopathy. I think sometimes you'll see like the L5 radiculopathy kind of mimic or, or act like a SI joint, you know, concern. But um, clinically, those people are going to have a positive. Now, both, you could argue, have positive straight leg signs, depending on how you how you do your straight leg test exactly. But I don't find that many patients with an L5 disc that's herniated causing an L5 or S1 radiculopathy having significant pain when I turn their hip internally and externally like you would when you have SI joint pain. And, and so I think there's a mechanical difference. Anybody who has a really hot disc is going to have pain the moment you lift your the foot, you know, even just a few degrees. Have you ever had a back problem yourself? <laughs> well, I mean, to live is to have back pain, Chad. Okay, so. well, I've already had back surgery. So, I mean, oh, I, I, know I, I know I look like I'm 25, but I'm not. I'm double that. And so... Uh, you know, I had back, when I had my back surgery, when somebody had a straight leg rise on me, it, it, it changed the whole meaning of it because the second they put their finger underneath my heel and lifted it even a few millimeters, I was done, right? So I would, I would uh, address Jerome's question slightly different, which is to say, I love that you come at it from sports medicine because you guys, I think, are, are sort of much more gifted at times with physical exam findings, just like chiropractors are too. I believe Jerome might be a chiropractor, but imaging also provides some clues. So if, if on the MRI, their disc has these modic one changes, yep. um, I get, I, I get a little bit sucked into what I see on imaging. I also like to use spec scans. I know it's controversial out there, but I find a, a fancy bone scan that, really is hot somewhere um, could could sort of help with that. I want to get to what you talked about the the um, the burning uh, the um, radio frequency ablation. I think you called it cool leaf. Yeah. Um, so my I want to sort of address that separately. My my issue with that is is when we do SI blocks, you are essentially anesthetizing the posterior and anterior aspect of the joint. Right, right. That's But right. when you do the denervation procedures, the ventral aspect of the joint is still innervated. That's right, that's right. So if they're responding to that, I really think that their pain is more of a myofascial pain or an extra articular pain. So that's a great point. But what you would do in that situation is do lateral branch blocks. Yes, but it's still an extra. You're still treating the myofascial component. You're not treating necessarily the SI joint so much as you're treating the 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 associated structures posteriorly. Okay. Because okay. because if you just do the lateral aspect, you're you're not addressing the nerve fibers that are ventral. Right. I I, oh. I agree with that statement. Okay. Anyway, that's just a little tiger tidbit. No, um, that's good. But so you you hit on something a minute ago with your motive changes while we're talking about RFA. Let's just say a little piece about intercept. Have you done intercept yet? I have. I have. So I have found that to be also when if in your scenario, you you told Jerome about where there's motive changes. I'm not thinking a side joint. I'm thinking vertebrogenic pain. Correct. Because, because it's just like I always tell people, if you put up an MRI and a medical student can point to something that's wrong, that's probably what's wrong. And when you see edema all on the end plates and they have mainly axial back pain, doesn't really radiate, you got to be thinking about vertebrogenic pain and, and basic vertebral nerve ablation. So I think you yes. hit on something there. So let's, let's tell our listeners a little bit more about intracept um, because I, I tend to think that that's really going to be a game changer. Yeah. Um, I, I think that discogenic pain, vertebrogenic pain has been very challenging to treat and uh, very common in people. For sure. And, and so here's a procedure where basically we're doing a root canal mm -hmm. to the disc. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 this has been very rewarding. I've had a hard time um, offering my patients uh, this 
procedure, not because they don't want it, not because there isn't a high volume of patients that would benefit from it, right. but it's so new. I don't think, at least in Alabama, that the insurance companies are are able to are are providing their 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 patients with this technology. Yeah, so that's that's been a problem in Texas as well. You know, so what we're finding is it's getting better. But um, there was even probably at one point a three to six month lag between ordering a procedure and it actually going to completion. And as you can imagine, during that time, sometimes things change. Maybe their symptoms change. Maybe their interest changes. And so it, it, I had some of those patients, too, that got in the pipeline. And then when they finally got approved, they were like, you know, now I have this big, ridiculous pain. I think I'm going to have surgery. You know, things like that. But the patients we have had a chance to work on have had really phenomenal improvement. And yeah, um, that's and been my experience oh, as well. It's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's a totally different way of thinking. You hit on it, Brad. We used to, in medical school, we were taught the pain is all because of that disc that's degenerative. Is it really? Well, a lot of us have degenerative discs and don't have axial back pain. So why, how, do you, how do you explain that? Well, when you get to the point where you have edema in your implants, those motor changes, it's advanced. I just saw one 15 minutes ago. I explained this to a patient 15 minutes ago that the bones are, it's like a knee that has bone on bone knee arthritis and the bones get edematous. And it's the same thing in the back. And so they, everybody can kind of equate those two things because they know what bone on bone knee pain feels like. They just can't fathom the fact that their little shock absorbers have gone down to nothing and they need new shock absorbers. And in lieu of that, we can go and ablate the nerve that gives the pain to the disc. So, uh, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of our talk about about how you look at functionality. Right. And, and, and these patients um, really exhibit a incredible change in their function. I had one patient who, you know, uh, teaches horseback riding and, yep. and literally, literally went from not being able to ride a horse to the next day or three days later back on the horse doing jumps. Yep. And uh, it's it's in, and it is again. It's like a, a root canal. Um, you mentioned the the changes in the knee. I believe you do some denervation, some burning of the nerves around right. the knee. Right. And, and that can be a very rewarding procedure for people that can't get their knee replaced. Absolutely. And so maybe you could tell our our viewers a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been doing this for sixteen years, and it's a I've uh, taught people in Australia and in Singapore and other places how to do this because it's a very simple addition to knee treatment because what a lot of people do in their algorithm is they inject steroids or inject platelet-rich plasma or inject, you know, one of the visco supplements and the patients are not getting long-term benefit. But here's, here's the real key. You need to be looking for people that are not unstable, that have knee pain either before or after knee surgery, but their stability factors there because I don't want to try to tell somebody that if I denervate their sensory nerves, I'm going to make their knee more stable, right? It's just going to decrease their pain. And sometimes the knee kind of tricks out because of pain. That's what we know in athletes happens. So in older people, you could give them that possibility. And for that reason, you go and do a block of the geniculate nerves of the knee. But the radiofrequency ablations are giving patients between a year and two years of benefit. Um, I find the best places to put this into practice is somebody who is young and have multiple scopes and really doesn't need another surgery until they need a new replacement. And I say young, maybe, you know, 25 to 45 or somebody who has had a total joint replacement that looks perfect by the surgeon's eyes, but the patient still hurts the same or somebody who is maybe overweight or has too many comorbidities to have surgery or they're too old to have surgery. These are all great candidates. So we're, we're about to talk with, um, Dr. Um, Antonia Chen, who works with Harvard, I'm going to do a talk with her on the 30th about it. She's an orthopedic surgeon who has seen the need for this. And what she saw lately is that a lot of people going through the COVID, if I can mention that, you know, they, they couldn't get to their knee replacement because they didn't want to go in and have a major surgery with everybody in space suits. But going in and having a five or 10 minute little ablation gives them some pause and comfort to get by until their surgery. And which, then maybe they'll do better I'm, postoperatively. I'm curious, Chad, which particular product do you use? Do you use like a, a, a venom or do you use more of the uh, Cool Leaf? Cool Leaf. Uh, yeah, Cool Leaf is the only one that's FDA approved for geniculate. But I use Cool Leaf for the hip, the knee, the shoulder, the neck, back, SI joint. Okay. Yeah, I don't use Cool Leaf in my practice, but uh, but please tell us a little bit about how that's different than traditional radio frequency. 
Okay. So th- one of the reasons it may not be useful if you have mainly a practice based out of surgery centers, some surgery centers find the cost is too high. But the reason it's beneficial for me, number one, is the lesion is going to be a larger round lesion. So when you look at, if you can see my finger, most radiofrequency needles burn from distal to proximal. And they, depending on whether you use a venom or whatever, and you open it up and, and reburn or things like that, the cool leaf burn is distal. So it's all past my finger and it's circular. And so I can come into any spot at any angle, perpendicular, parallel, 30 degree oblique, whatever, and it's going to get the same ablation. So it, number one, it's an easier needle to place. Number two, it's a larger lesion. And, and you, people would argue, well, if you, if you do a lesion and you turn it the other way and do another lesion, and I'm trying to do things in a very efficient, fast way. Yeah, exactly. Less burns are better and less anesthesia time is better. And so literally you can place all four of these needles and burn them all at the same time. And you can be in and out of a case. In all four. Minutes. So um, are you placing three needles or four needles? Well, for the most part, three, but anybody who has anterior knee or posterior knee behind the knee or pain behind the kneecap, I'll do a distal femur branch as well. And Where's so, that distal femur branch? So about two or three uh, finger breaths above the superior border of the patella. And that catches one of the femoral nerves as it goes down into the anterior knee. Okay. So the geniculate nerves, obviously what you're getting at is we stay away from the inferior lateral branch. Because right. you don't want to get anywhere near the common peroneal nerve, right? Exactly. So we do a, a superior medial and lateral, an inferior medial, and then this distal femur one on, on occasion. And most people are doing that routinely now. All right, I'm going to read some of these comments just to get to them. Sure. Um, Anthony says, we are starting to get more approvals down here in Florida. Did one this AM that got a week, that got a week approval. That's good. Excited to see it start getting covered. Frank mentions... That kind of disc degeneration you describe as common in donor cadavers we use in our teaching if they are over the age of 70. So, so, so disc degeneration is just really very common, period. Right. The, key, the key is these modic changes Absolutely. that we see on MRI. And, and, and Frank, you may have to look up modic. Modic's a radiologist in Ohio who was the first one to describe, to describe these. But you see basically edema or swelling above and below the disc in the what are called the vertebral end plates. Also, Frank, we need to get to the cadaver lab and show people all these, all this anatomy, okay? Anthony says, thoughts on genicular nerve ablation three weeks pre-op of total knee. I would say it's fine. Absolutely. Uh, let me let me go back to one thing that that, that was just mentioned. The age range, I, I think what he's when you're thinking about the intercept classification, if you will, I see this as like a 45 to 65 thing. Um, and so if they I have 45 year olds that played hard and, and you know, rode hard and have, you know, motive changes. And so the guy that said 70 years and up, I think that's probably if you look at most people 70 and up, they're all going to have degenerative disc disease, many of them motive changes, but they're going to have 50 other things going on in their spine. If you have yeah. a 45 or 55 year old come in that has axial back pain and they have motive changes, this should, this should be one of the first things you're thinking about. To your other question about pre-op, there, there's some studies being done right now and favorable outcomes that show that surgeons are finding much better post-operative pain control in patients that have this done preoperatively. And I think that's what, I haven't talked to Dr. Chen about it yet, but I bet that's what we get into in our talk we're going to do on the 30th because she is a real big proponent. She's an orthopedic surgeon and she's a real big proponent of, of passing this off to her pain doctor to do these procedures beforehand. And so I'm looking forward to that conversation and there's really no reason not to do it. The only reason not to do it is if a patient, you know, is, is afraid to have a couple of different times in the OR or whatever else, because you need to do your geniculate nerve blocks for the most part in the OR with some sedation. Um, if you do them in the office under ultrasound, they can be done pretty easily where you can see your neurovascular bundle and put the needle in the bundle without hitting the bone. But the moment that that periosteum is touched by the needle, it hurts. And but so- if you were, if you were doing this as a, as a, as a pre-op type of, um, treatment to sort of help with recovery from a total knee replacement, yeah. I don't even think that I would do, uh, 
nerve blocks. I think I would just go ahead and do the radio frequency or burning procedure. Um, that's in Hobart, Australia. That's what they do in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised at that because Nick Bogdus, Bogduck has us doing double blocks on everything, and I think we should just go right to the ablation. Sure. Um, Rich Manry says, um, kyphoplasty, that, that what do you think about the cement in, um, for uh, vertebral body fractures is actually causing the relief of pain by burning the basovertebral nerve, which is what we do in Relievant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a strong possibility. I mean, I think, I think when Relievant came out about a year or two or three years ago, people started thinking, hmm, maybe that's the mechanism that, that putting cement in the vertebral body. And, and what our listeners, what our lay listeners need to know is that when we inject a liquid cement into the spine, it hardens up and becomes really hard, but it does that through a what's called an exothermic reaction, meaning meaning heat is given yep. off, and the heat is incredible. It's very very hot. Yes, and so we think that that heat that's given off in the reaction that hardens the cement, where it goes from liquid to solid, may actually be burning the nerve inside the vertebral body and causing pain relief that way. And that's a good thought, but but these a lot of these patients that have like a wedge fracture still, believe it or not, don't have motive changes. Um, so Frank has sent us a link, and I put it in the stream, um, and I'm not really sure. It says physical therapy is good as surgery and less risky for one type of low back pain. So, um, hmm. I'd like to know more. I think physical therapy is the best. Absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, as far as conservative treatment goes, that's certainly, um, you know, the gold standard. You know, we get, we really tend to get involved when physical therapy fails. That's right. Um, there seems to be a debate about surgery versus stretching and yoga for re relieving low back pain and sci sciatica, share your opinions. You want to go first or you want me to go first? Well, go ahead. Why don't you start? All right. I don't know if you can read the comments like I can. No, I can't. That's why I'm going to kind of feed off of what All you right. said. So I'm going to read it again. Frank said, there seems to be a debate about surgery versus stretching and yoga for relieving low back pain and sciatica. Share your opinion. I think that s stretching and yoga um, has – much less morbidity than surgery. So that's a great place to start. If time is your friend, if time is your ally, then for sure stretching and yoga would be better than doing surgery. And it is rare that people need to do surgery in terms of you know, losing bodily functions immediately. But some people are just so hot that the pain doctor can't even calm them down. And, and it is surgery. They need to go in and, and remove the piece of disc. Like you had surgery. Right. You were probably so hot. Yep. You just couldn't wait on stretching or time or yoga to really help. Yeah. So there's, there's degrees of, to answer that question from my standpoint, I totally agree with your standpoint of, of going from least invasive to most invasive or least complicated to more complicated. And I think that's what this gentleman's talking about, or this, this person, this woman, whoever reached out to you. The, the important thing here is what you hit on is the bodily function, not just their bowel and their bladder, but are they having neurologic deficits? Because if they hurt down their leg, they have quote sciatic pain, but no neurologic deficit. The time clock has started, but it's not it's not ticking to where we have to, you know, explode. And so what I typically try to do is I look at the patient and I say, if I am I if I'm your therapist and I'm going to be working this person and you come to my therapy office, am I going to be able to do anything with you? If they look at me and they say, you know, every man, I move back a few millimeters and my back's killing me. Or if I oh, if I sit or stand, they're going to get nothing out of therapy whatsoever. You know, I, I've been a director of several physical therapy units and did physical therapy during college as a job. What you need to do is get some of those pain generators modified so that then they can come into therapy and benefit from it. But absolutely, yeah. therapy, conservative treatment is a part of it. It just it, it fits in different time frames in my practice. 
but it all depends on that patient's presentation, not on the MRI, not, it depends on the patient's presentation. And if the patient can't get much out of therapy, I'm going to shoot them with a couple of nerve blocks or something to get them some pain relief so then they can go to therapy. And Because therapy visits are, are blocked into so many visits per insurance per year. And you don't want to waste your first three visits just doing heat and ice. Right. Ultimately, we want to get patients playing ultimate. <laughs> yeah, I love we, it. Ultimately, we want to get people moving regardless. Well, we've gone for over 30 minutes. I know you've got clinic. I know you went over time. Um, Chad, tell us a little bit about Noble Sports Medicine, how they find you. Uh, maybe uh, Christy will figure out how to push this show into Texas so people see it there. Obviously, most of my friends are in Birmingham, so they're not going to go to Texas to see you. But but I don't think so. You know, I'm sure on Facebook, somebody will find them from Texas. So tell us tell us how we find you in Texas. No, for, first of all, I think it's really cool that I know Anthony chimed in that you and Anthony and I all use the same social media people. And I think that is super cool because we're going to be hearing about uh, and communicating in ways that other doctors may not. But I have a podcast that is similar to what we're doing here. It's called Dr. Steven Speaks. Uh, that is one way to hear different things. I usually talk to athletes, um, especially during COVID. I tried to find some pro players that would talk to me, their friends and things like that to kind of get people that there really are sports still going to come back in the world. And so my podcast is usually relating sports and medicine, my two favorite things. Okay. And then they can find me at noblepainandsports.com, my website. And the website has several different procedures we do that you do as well, Brad, that are on there that kind of describe what we do and some blogs there and things like that. We're also trying to really get into the Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn world to try to make sure that people know that we're a thought leader for different companies and for products and that we want to be involved in that. So I just recently took on something called the Council of States for Aspen. And so I'll be a representative for Texas when it comes to the Aspen team, which is really a nationwide group of pain doctors. They're doing what we're doing here. We're educating each other, sharpening each other with our, with our knives and, and knowing that that I might have been exposed to something that you have been exposed to, but I want to know what's worked well for your patients. And so I would encourage people to, to try to get on, on your Doc Talk Live all the time they can. My podcast, look at our website. Same thing's true of, of Dr. Grafita. He's doing a fantastic job down in uh, Florida. And here we are in three different states. We have three different kinds of insurances we deal with as far as, you know, hurdles and things we have to do, but we're all on the same page. We're all on the same team trying to make our patients better by using our hands and not our prescription pads. And I think that's what it comes down to. If you uh, just allow me a second, I want to plug Doc Talk Live and, and, and uh, I loved what you had to say. I want to plug Doc Talk Live to say, you know, what I'm really trying to do with this show is not promote Brad Goodman, not promote pain and intervention, although you're an interventionalist and you do that. What I want with these vodcasts is to get enough people watching so that people can actually run the show in, in, in terms of, hey, I've got heart disease. I want to talk to this cardiologist. I want to type in my question. I've got diabetes or osteoporosis or, or whatever. I want it to be so, so there is a media outlet in a social situation that people can actually communicate one-on-one -on -one with with somebody who is intimately aware and treats their issue i love it so that's what i want to do with doc talk live i'm not there yet i i clearly don't have the the uh the the bandwidth yet um but you know by doing shows and and having Anthony and you do shows, I think it'll only help. So I appreciate you taking the time today, Chad. No, your, your heart's in the right place, Brad. I mean, it, there's so much we know and want to get to the public. And, and what is the best medium to get there? I mean, we're we're doctors. None of us got a degree in social you know, media and, and broadcasting or marketing. I mean, we need the help of other people to do that. But what we want to do is find the people that have the needs for the things that we provide or, to your point, other medical problems, just being a source and a friend for them. So you did a great job today. Thanks for having me on. And I look forward to talking to you more in the future. Thanks so much, Chad. Uh -huh. Take care, Brad. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.